on air, online, on demand. Watch AFR when you want, where you want with CN8, the Comcast Network. Okay, let's turn now to politics. We've been uh, doing this uh, week-long series comparing the candidates as we approach the political conventions. And today, we want to take a look at the legacy the next president could have on the Supreme Court. We have our legal analyst, Suzette Malveaux, standing by to talk about the political effect either candidate could have on the future of the court. But first, we want to start with correspondent Brian Todd as he takes a look at the politics of the Supreme Court. It's not easy. From gun control to Guantanamo detainees, the Supreme Court makes crucial rulings by the slimmest of margins. Those two decisions, and one banning the death penalty for child rapists, are five to four votes. The swing vote each time, and in several five to four decisions dating back to the last term, Justice Anthony Kennedy. How powerful has he become? Justice Kennedy is now one of the most powerful people in the United States. Uh, his vote determines how the Constitution is going to be interpreted in many areas of law. Analysts say Kennedy considers himself conservative, but he's often voted with the liberal wing of the court. That group, Justices John Paul Stevens, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Stephen Breyer, and David Souter, may lose as many as three of its members over the next few years to retirement. Of their conservative colleagues, Chief Justice John Roberts, Justices Antonin Scalia, Clarence Thomas, and Samuel Alito, none are believed to be near retirement. Analysts say that means this presidential election will have a huge impact on the court. The court's already, by modern terms, really pretty conservative, but this election could decide its future for the next three or four decades. If John McCain wins, he'd be able to shape a much more conservative court. How's he leaning? I will look for people in the cast of John Roberts, Samuel Alito, and my friend, the late William Rehnquist. If Barack Obama wins, experts say his best shot is to maintain the court's ideological balance if some of the liberals retire. I think, uh, actually, Justice Breyer, Justice Ginsburg are very sensible judges. I think that uh, Justice Souter, who was a Republican appointee, uh, is a sensible judge. The cultural issues this court in transition may decide on over the next generation? Gun control, affirmative action, religion, and of course... The $64,000 question, if uh, John McCain is elected, uh, is uh, whether there is going to become a five-person majority at the court to actually overturn Roe versus Wade. Okay, that sets up the premise for what we want to talk about because obviously there is so much that is at stake here when you look at the, the high court and the justices on this high court. Keep in mind, this is a job that you cannot be fired from. Once you are appointed, you are appointed for life. And uh, there could be uh, quite a shift in the uh, faces on the Supreme Court with this uh, next administration. Let's talk about that now. We do have our legal analyst, Suzette Malveaux, uh, who is a law professor at the Columbus School of Law at the Catholic University of America in D.C. And uh, she's with me now, and she studies the courts uh, quite extensively. Suzette, good to see you again. Hi, Art. Um, you know, when we talk about the landscape of the Supreme Court and the next president, uh, this president will have quite an impact. Isn't that right? That's right, Art. Um, if you look at whoever becomes the next president, they may have a large impact on the composition of the court and ultimately the philosophy of the court. That's because if you look at decisions that come really close, or 5-4 decisions, you've got four justices that we'd call sort of liberal. We'd have four justices that you'd put in the conservative camp with Justice Kennedy sort of swinging back and forth and being the tiebreaker in very close cases. How do you see the difference between the candidates in terms of what kind of Supreme Court justice each would select should they have the office? Well, McCain has said that he would pick somebody from, sort of cut from the cloth of a, uh, uh, a Justice Roberts, uh, Chief Justice Roberts, uh, a Justice um, Alito, and that he sort of um, is not supportive of what he calls judicial um, activist judges, those who would actually make law as opposed to interpret the law. Obama, on the other hand, has voted against both Justice Alito and Chief Justice Roberts during the confirmation hearings, and he's, um, he said that really somebody like the late Chief Justice Earl Warren would be more of his pick, somebody who spearheaded the civil rights types of cases coming out of the 50s and 60s and the uh, historic Brown decision, Brown versus Board of Education, which ultimately found segregation unconstitutional. Those are the kinds of um, cases and the kind of bent that it seems Obama 
is supportive of, somebody right. who and would be empathetic and as well as uh, judicial. And, and interesting you should point out uh, this because uh, just this past weekend when they did their civil forum, um, uh, Senator Obama also said that the justices that probably he would not um, like to see on the court would be Justice Alito, Justice Roberts, and he mentioned one more, that would be Justice Clarence Thomas. That's right. Yeah, um, in terms of uh, the ones, because they're considered younger on the court and, and will not likely be changing, but in terms of ones who might uh, retire uh, over the course of the next four to eight years in the administration, uh, two names come to mind, uh, top of mind, and I want to get your reaction to this, and that would be Justice Stevens and Justice Ginsburg. Do you agree with that? I think that's right. I mean, we don't know ultimately who's going to retire. It's really, we're doing a lot of speculation here, but you can imagine within but, but the older. next administration, they're absolutely, Stevens is 88 now and uh, Ginsburg is 75. The oldest Supreme Court justice retired at age 90. So probably it's, it's likely that you're going to have those retirements come up, which means that McCain is going to have a greater shot at making an impact on the court. He'll be able to replace liberals um, with conservative justices, whereas Obama, even if there are, um, even if there are um, um, retirements, he might not have the opportunity to actually replace a conservative. He yeah. might actually keep the status quo and replace a liberal with another liberal. Obviously, there's something else that needs to be pointed out here, and that is the president does, is not the ultimate authority on actually who sits on the That's bench. Right. There is the confirmation process, and that can be quite uh, a contested battle. Uh, walk us through uh, that process and, 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 and how it works uh, on that end. Well, certainly the president is going to put forward um, nominations, is going to nominate people with certain credentials, and then it goes through the Senate confirmation hearings, which is a incredibly, as you mentioned, a sort of um, contentious kind of process. It turns out that the, the, um, the Senate may filibuster um, names that come before it. The Senate can definitely block somebody from being nominated. So, for example, um, if Obama has a shot at replacing somebody, a Democrat-controlled um, uh, Senate is probably going to go ahead and approve that decision. McCain, on the other hand, even if he has an opportunity to replace a liberal justice, if he tries to put in somebody very conservative, the Senate can block that decision and uh, make sure that doesn't happen. And so you definitely have the Senate playing a very important role in terms of who ultimately is going to uh, fill that position. You know, Suzette, as we've been talking about these, um, uh, these uh, chief uh, and, and very important issues that, that the next president will have to face, one topic that keeps coming up, and that is the, the president's influence, or be it their charisma, in, in, in working across the aisles and building coalitions so that they could uh, get a confirmation uh, hearing process, their person passed through confirmation, and being able to, um, uh, to bring people together on their side of the vote. That's right. I think that that, that is an essential ingredient here is that you are going to find, I mean, you want uh, whoever becomes president to select somebody that everybody can pretty much get on board with, that they're going to respect, respect their intellect, respect that they will be adherent to the law, that they are not going to, in either direction, sort of function as an activist uh, judge, because it really, you know, they have to follow precedent, they have to give um, respect to decisions that came before them. And so both, both candidates really need to be the type of people that would do that. Okay. Well, uh, it will be interesting to see, and uh, we appreciate you uh, uh, helping to uh, navigate the, the legal landscape at what's at stake on the high court. And then, you know, we didn't even get to talk about the appellate court, because oftentimes those key decisions are made there. They don't even make it up to the uh, to the Supreme Court. You're right. You're right, Art. Only 4% of um, the cases, of the, the Supreme Court only hears 4% of cases coming out of the appellate court level. And so really the important decisions that this next president is going to make is who's going to fill the federal district courts? Who's going to fill the appellate court decisions? That's usually the buck stops there. So we really want to watch um, those those decisions very carefully. Yeah, yes, because you're absolutely right. That's where a lot of decisions are made. Suzette Malvo, our legal analyst. Thank you very much. Thanks, Art. Okay, always a pleasure. Okay, of course, we'll be uh, continuing this, and the next uh, stage will be comparing the candidates uh, in the issue of foreign policy. How do Senators John McCain and Barack Obama shape up in the matters of uh, foreign affairs and their policies there? We'll talk about that tomorrow right here on The Report.